What does it mean to spend time with Jesus? You may have heard the phrase before, spending time with Jesus. I'm going to spend time with Jesus. I need to spend more time with Jesus. You may have heard all those before and wondered, what does it mean? After all, Jesus is up in heaven, seated at the right hand of God the Father, according to Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, and many other verses. And of course, we also know that God is a spirit, and those who worship him must do so in spirit and in truth, according to John chapter 4, verse 24. So how does these verses inform us regarding our time with him? What can we learn from these verses about spending time with Jesus? Many times I've heard people say that spending time with Jesus is engaging in religious activities such as attending church services, Christian conferences, Bible reading plans, or any of the other things that we generally consider to be religious behaviors. However, in this study today, I would like to share with you a different perspective, one that may be a bit uncomfortable at first and may require you to take a step back from the common idea of what spending time with Jesus is and see it in a different light. A light not based on a religious checklist, but instead based on relationship with a God who gave everything to restore you. Welcome to Thriving Branch. I'm Jim. Today we are discussing spending quality time with Jesus and what that actually means because it's kind of become a phrase that we often say but don't often stop to consider what it actually means. After all, Jesus is up there, we're down here. What does it mean to actually spend quality time with him. And before we look at what spending quality time with Jesus is, we should establish some facts about what spending quality time with Jesus is not. As it turns out, there are a lot of different ideas about what spending time with Jesus is. And truthfully, it can indeed take some different forms. God is not boxed into a specific equation as far as how he's going to spend his time with his children. However, there are a few things that spending quality time with Jesus is clearly not, and we need to know what those are. So let's go over some of the points about what quality time with Jesus clearly is not. And some of these I mentioned before in a previous study, I'll link to that as well in case you want to see that. But I'll just briefly go over some of those points here. The first of which, as I also mentioned in the opening of this study, is simply performing religious service or duty for God. Quality time with Jesus is not simply performing religious service or religious duties although some people mistake it as such. In some places, in fact, quality time with Jesus, spending time with him, has actually been replaced by being religiously busy. And do you understand what I mean when I say religiously busy? I mean, do, doing church service all the time, Bible reading all the time, Christian conferences, filling all of your free time with what would be considered Christian things or religious duties, and, and just letting that totally saturate your life, being so busy running from one thing to the next that you don't even know which way is up half the time. You're, you're going right from one to the other. I just got out of church, now I'm going to go to this conference, then I'm going to read my Bible for four hours, you know, and then I'm going to listen to some Christian radio and, and, you know, filling your entire life with all of this stuff and saying you're spending all of that with God when in fact all you're doing 
is performing religious service, religious checklist, Christian duties. And let me ask you a question, because some people do consider that to be quality time with God, doing all this Christian stuff. But if you just think about it logically for a minute, you'll see that that idea doesn't really hold up to scrutiny. For example, if you as a parent, and even if you're not a parent, let's just assume that you are for the sake of this discussion. If you as a parent wanted to spend quality time with your children, how would you do that? Would you keep them busy, constantly busy with work, having them do things for you, having them do their chores? Would you give them so many things to do that they'd be running from one to the next, to the next, to the next, and call that quality time with them? Or would you rather have them take some time off of their chores and spend time with you, simply conversing, interacting with you, enjoying each other's company, companionship. Which of those two would you consider to be quality time with your child? Or how about a husband and wife relationship since Jesus often spoke about his relationship with the church in marital terms? Would you consider your spouse being constantly busy, running from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing to be quality time with your spouse, with your lover? Or would you instead consider quality time with your spouse as being able to enjoy some quiet time with them, just the two of you? Which of those two would you consider to be quality time? You see what I'm saying? I trust that these two examples are starting to make it more clear. Jesus is recorded in the scriptures several times, in fact, as spending time alone with the Father when Jesus was on the earth. And we'll look at those a bit later in this study. But for now, just keep this in the back of your mind. Jesus talked about this, and what he had to say is very important. But generally, we gloss over what he said, or just ignore it entirely in favor of religious tradition and personal doctrines of men that we have grown up with and we are comfortable with. And that, my dear friend, is dangerous. When we start to hold on to man-made traditions, religious traditions and doctrines of men and what we grew up with and what we're comfortable with and we let all of that replace the truth, now we're on dangerous ground. In Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 through 23, this is what Jesus had to say on the subject. Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 through 23. Let's read it together. Ready? One, two, read. Not every one that said to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name have cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works? And then... Well, I profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Now, I invite you to take a real and open look at what Jesus is saying here. Apart from the religious doctrines and the opinions of men, because at the end of it all, what men say about it simply doesn't matter. Only what Jesus says carries any weight. And look at what he said. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Now let's stop here for a moment and take just this one statement because there are some people today who think that calling Jesus Lord is a sign of salvation. There are quite a number of people, in fact, who believe that. If you call Jesus Lord, if you say he's your Lord, then you're saved. But here, Jesus plainly says that that's not true. He goes on to say that the one who does the will of the Father in heaven is the one that will enter the kingdom of heaven. And this is where most people immediately jump back into a works mindset, a religious mindset, and they start thinking about the law, and they start thinking about works. But Jesus didn't stop here. He continues by saying, many, many, and I really wish he didn't say many here, but he did. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name? Haven't we cast out demons? Haven't we done many wonderful works? And these are the epitome of great works that many people are striving for. The works listed here are what many people are constantly reaching for and trying to accomplish. And yet Jesus still says that it is not what matters. These things, they don't matter. The will of the Father goes beyond these things. In fact, in verse 23, Jesus still calls these things works of iniquity. So wait a minute. Isn't prophesying in the name of Jesus a good thing to do? Isn't casting out demons a good thing to do? Aren't all these wonderful works good things to do? Well, Jesus isn't saying that these things are wrong in and of themselves, but that it goes hand in hand with Jesus' next statement. I never knew you. That is what causes these things to be works of iniquity. Not because the works themselves are wrong, but because they were done in iniquity outside of Christ. He never knew them. You see, even though we generally assign value to our works, they really don't have any value. Only one thing matters in the end. Are you in Christ or are you outside of Christ? It's whether he knows you or not, not how many works you do. So that's the first aspect of what quality time with Jesus is not. It's not merely performing works or service or personal sacrifices, or any of the things that we generally assign spiritual value to. It's not any of those things. The second aspect of what quality time with Jesus is not, is it's not merely Bible reading, not merely scripture reading. This is another big one for a lot of people because there are is a lot of confusion regarding the Bible in general. For example, there are those who think that the Bible is in itself Jesus. They take it to be a truly living book in the literal sense of the word. And so they think that by reading their Bible, they're automatically spending time with Jesus. Because if you see Jesus as your Bible, if you see your Bible as Jesus, then they're one and the same as far as your perspective is concerned. And so there are people who think that reading their Bible is automatically spending time with Jesus. They're one and the same. Now the problem with this idea is that it's not what Jesus himself believes. Jesus himself 
does not say that he is your Bible. In fact, Jesus makes a distinction between himself and the scriptures in John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40. He doesn't believe he's your Bible. So I think we should listen to him regarding who or what he is instead of our own doctrines again, instead of our own little human theologies. Jesus is talking to a group of Pharisees in John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40, and this is what he says. I want you to turn there and read this with me because it's very important. If you do not even know who or what Jesus is, you're going to have a very hard time having a real relationship with him. John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40 say this. You search the scriptures. Remember, this, this is Jesus talking. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me, and you will not come to me that you might have life. Now, this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. And we can plainly see here that Jesus is redirecting the attention and the focus of the Pharisees to where life and salvation can truly be found. And this is a lesson that we all should pay attention to and learn well. Life does not come from scripture text. It comes from Jesus. I'm going to say that again because I know that that cuts a lot of people right where they have their little pet theology. Life does not come from Scripture. It comes from Jesus. And understanding that those two things are different is essential. And if you have a problem with that, it's not me you have a problem with. It's Jesus, because he's the one who said it. Jesus is the source of life, not Scripture. Some people think that what I just said is blasphemy, and if so, I suggest that you address the issue with Jesus, because he's the one that said it. Look again. He plainly tells the Pharisees in that verse, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. But the scriptures actually testify of me. That is what Jesus said. Do you see the distinction he's making there? Searching the scriptures constantly, reading the scriptures religiously, is not what gives you life. You may think that it does, just like the Pharisees did, but the real source of life is Jesus Christ alone. And please understand, I am not downplaying the importance of scripture. It does indeed point you to Jesus, the author and the giver of life, but the scriptures themselves are not that life. It's like a signpost pointing the way to your destination. But if you stand there and focus in on the signpost and the color of the signpost and how pretty the little arrow is on the signpost, and you never actually look where the signpost is telling you to go, and you just stand there and you look at the signpost, you're never going to get where you're trying to go. And that's the difference. Many people are totally enamored with the signpost instead of where the signpost is telling you to go. That's a very important distinction to make. Important enough for Jesus to drive the point home even further in verse 40. In verse 40, Jesus finishes his thought and says, And you will not come to me that you might have life. You see, the Pharisees didn't have any problem searching the scripture day and night. Where they had a problem was where it mattered most. They wouldn't come to Jesus. 
And if Jesus and the scripture were one and the same, Jesus would have never need to say what he said. Because if Jesus and the scripture were one and the same, then the Pharisees really didn't have a problem. But Jesus told them they did. They wouldn't come to him. And so they remained dead and they remained empty. And there are many people today with that exact same problem. So this is the second aspect of what quality time with Jesus is not. And that is quality time with Jesus is not merely reading your Bible. So now that we've established a few of what quality time with Jesus is not, what is it then? And as we are wrapping up our study today, let me bring your remembrance back to what we observed Jesus doing earlier in the study, which is spending time alone. But what exactly was he doing alone? When Jesus went away alone, when he left the crowds, after doing miracles or feeding the multitudes or whatever he was doing, he would often withdraw alone. The scripture records this many times. And I invite you to read these scriptures with me now to find out what he was doing. Luke chapter 5, verse 16, Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, and Mark chapter 1, verse 35 are three places that record Jesus spending time alone. Luke chapter 5, verse 16 says this, He often was withdrawing to remote places to pray. Matthew chapter 14, verse 23 says this, And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. And Mark chapter 1, verse 35 says this, And in the morning, rising up a great while before the day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there he prayed. So what does this tell us? We have a threefold witness about what Jesus was doing. And it is specific. He was praying alone. And this is beneficial for us to know. Once we understand what prayer actually is, and we have an entire study on that as well. Because prayer is so much more than what we generally make it out to be. We generally think of prayer as simply asking God for things or complaining to him as we often do. Although he certainly understands why we do that. I'm not saying it upsets him. He understands why we get upset sometimes, why we complain to him. And he has mercy on us, thank God. Nevertheless, prayer is more than that. Prayer is more than asking God for things or complaining to him. I'm not saying that those things are wrong, okay? I'm not saying those things are wrong. It's okay to ask God for things. I think he likes when we ask him for things because we're recognizing him as the source of things. And it's okay to complain to him because he understands and he wants us to bear his bur our burdens to him, okay? He does. But prayer is more than either of those things. Prayer at its core is conversation, communication with God. Not a one-way street, but actual communion between two interested persons, you and God. Does that seem difficult to accept? Do you think that when Jesus was praying alone, that the father remained silent and didn't respond to his son? Have you even thought about it? Do you think that when Jesus prayed to the father, the father kept quiet? No, of course not. Why then are we so quick to assume that God would not respond to us with the same level of interest that he responded to Jesus? 
And there lies the root of the problem. We don't truly recognize or see ourselves as being in Christ today. Why do you think God the Father would respond lesser to you than he did to Jesus? It's because you don't see yourself as being in Christ. You see yourself as having a disconnect. And as we saw earlier, this is one of the prerequisites upon which the entire relationship is built. We are in Christ. And that gives us status. That gives us a foundation. That gives us access to God that we could never have. I encourage you today, spend real quality time with Jesus. Not performing dead rituals, or tasks like a servant would, but by enjoying relationship with him as a beloved child, by having real communion and communication with him, enjoying and living in perfect harmony and unity with God, which Jesus himself paid for you to have. If you truly see yourself as in Christ, you will know that the Father is always attentive to your words. The Father is always attentive to you because you are in Christ. And that gives you access, like I said, and it gives you status. Not the status of a servant, but the status of a son. And understanding the rights that a son has in the family of God, especially the beloved son, Jesus, whom you are in. And I know I keep saying that because I want you to understand that you are in Christ and all of what that means. Because then you'll be able to talk to him and have communion with him, knowing that he is listening and responding. It's not speaking to the air or talking to an imaginary friend. It's communion and unity with God that only those who are in Christ can truly enjoy. And he paid for you to have it. So I say to you, be blessed.